Public Interest is chapter number 13 entitled Nature, the Enjoyer and Consciousness. Text number 27. Yavat Sandai Tenkin Chit. Yavat Sandai Tenkin Chit. Satvam Stavara Jankavam. Trees, mountains, and hills, which are not moving. 
And there are many existences which are moving. And all of them are but combinations of material nature and the superior nature, the living entity. Without a touch of the superior nature, the living entity, nothing can grow. The relationship between matter and nature is eternally going on. And this combination is affected by the supreme laws. Therefore, he is the controller of both the superior and the inferior natures. The material nature is created by him, and the superior nature is placed in this material nature. And thus, all these activities and manifestations take place. Being Shetra and Shetra Gyar, being the body and the 
the entity, the non government. So I'll take a, a couple of verses here from the second chapter, where Krishna introduced that subject. So Krishna introduced how the soul is eternal and the body is temporary and that the two are not joined together, they're two separate entities. But one verse that I like that summarizes Nasato Vijite Bhava, Nabhava Vijite Sataha, Ubayor Apajustontas, Tvanayos Tapadashvi, this is 2.16. Those who are seers of the truth have concluded that of the non-existent, the material body, there is no endurance, and of the eternal, the soul, there is no change. They have concluded this by studying the nature of both. So they're calling the material body non-existent because it has no endurance, because it's not permanent.
Engstrom Prabhupada is explaining the purport that this includes hills and mountains. Trees we know are living entities, although they don't move. But we have it a little difficult to try and understand how hills and mountains are also a combination of living entities and matter. So, so we're thinking this is my body. But within this body that we think is my body, there are actually many, 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 millions more living entities. We know from science that our digestion is helped by bacteria. There are friendly bacteria in our digestion that help our digestion. But even beyond this, every single organ is a living entity, every single cell is a living entity. The science will also show you this. They've done wonderful experiments on a single cell under a microscope and they stick a little hair into it and it moves. So what they're proving is that a single cell also has these four activities. Eating, mating, sleeping and defending. By sticking the little ear in it and the cell moves and tries to get out of the way, they're proving that it has this defending propensity. Even though it, it, it doesn't seem to be a conscious living entity, it actually has these, these same abilities. But beyond that, if we're going to understand fully that the non-moving and the moving is all a combination of the living entity and material nature, then we've also got what happens when we leave this body. We think this body just becomes material nature again. But there's a verse here where Srila Prabhupada talks about, this is uh, 2.24, a chejo yam and the hayo yam, a klejo yam shosha evacha, nature sarva gatasta, achalo yam sanatana. 2.24. This individual soul is unbreakable and insoluble and can be neither burned nor dried. He is everlasting, present everywhere, unchangeable, immovable and eternally the same. So one, one particular term that Srila Prabhupada picks up in the Purport is Sarvagataha, all pervading. So in the Purport, Srila Prabhupada speaks about this word Sarvagataha, all pervading. The word Sarvagata or pervading is significant because there is no doubt that living entities are all over God's creation. They live on the land, in the water, in the air, within the earth, and even within fire. The belief that they are sterilized in fire is not acceptable because it is clearly stated here that the soul cannot be burned by fire. Therefore, there is no doubt that there are living entities also in the sun planet with suitable bodies to live there. If the sun globe is uninhabited, then the world of Sarvagata, living everywhere, becomes meaningless. So this was a term that was picked up when I was studying the Bhakti Shastri. This Sarvagata needs to be fully understood. So in the scientific viewpoint, they think of air as being largely empty space. It's got oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and other gases in it. But they describe it as a few molecules with lots of space in between. So uh, my teacher is explaining that this word Sarvagata, if we really want to understand it according to the Acharya's vision, means that everywhere there are living entities. So what we think is dead, like this piece of plastic, may also have living entities in it. Sarvagata. So the point I'm trying to get at is that in understanding this term moving and unmoving, it will help us to understand that this body is not our body. One, to, one other place, well, there are many places even in Bhagavad Gita where Krishna uses the word moving and non-moving. One of them where he's describing how Krishna is the source of the moving and non-moving is 
Maya Jakshena Prakriti, Suyate Sacharacharam, Hedunanena Gortaya Jagat Bipari Vartate. This material nature, which is one of my energies, is working under my direction, O Sarapunti, producing all moving and non moving beings. Under its rule, this manifestation is created again and again. So this is explaining similar things to what today's verse is explaining, but today's verse has the more details. In this verse, Krishna is saying that the material nature is one of his energies. And from the material nature, moving and non-moving beings have created, manifested, created, and annihilated again and again. In the purport, Srila Prabhupada also mentions how the living entities come from the material nature as the Lord is the seed giving father and the material nature is the womb from which they come. But actually the Supreme Lord is the cause of both the material nature and the living entities, the products of material nature. explains all these living entities, although born under the glance of the Supreme Lord, take their different bodies according to their past deeds and desires. So the Lord is not directly attached to material creation. He simply glances over material nature. Material nature is thus activated and everything is created immediately. Because he glances over material nature, there is undoubtedly activity on the part of the Supreme Lord, but he has nothing to do with the manifestation of the material world directly. The example is given in the Smriti. When there is a fragrant flower before summer, the fragrance is touched by the smelling person, the power of the person. Yet the smelling and the flower are detached from one another. So we can understand a flower has a scent. We perceive the scent of the flower. That doesn't make us part of the flower. The scent comes into our senses and is perceived, but we're still separate from the flower itself. There is a similar connection between the material world and the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Actually, he has nothing to do with the material world, but he creates by his glance and ordains. In summary, material nature, without the superintendence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, cannot do him. Yet the Supreme Personality is detached from all material activities. So now in, in this chapter, we have learned how the super soul, although he's not personally involved, he doesn't personally create our bodies or create our karmas, yet he is present as the knower of our body. He is present as Anamata, Rupa Drishta, the super the overseer and permitter. And so therefore he is very intimately connected with us. But we have to come to this full understanding of the difference between us and the body. So these words, Kshetra and Kshetra Kya, are meant to be helpful for us, but sometimes we tend to shy away from them because they're a little bit philosophical in nature. But they're supposed to actually help us understand the difference and the separation there was another verse where Krishna was explaining how other things were involved. Okay, in the 
verses 6 to 7, Krishna has said, The five great elements, false ego, intelligence, the unmanifested, ten senses of the mind, five sense objects. So there's we can We've heard many times in this understanding of Sankhya, description, how there are five gross elements and three subtle elements. The unmanifested is the soul. Ten senses in the mind, five sense objects. But then Krishna goes on to add the different, some of the different products of this combination. Desire, hatred, happiness, distress. So these things also we assume are ours. And in one verse also it says we're the cause of the sufferings. But we need to detach from them. The point of this understanding is to detach from them. To understand that this body is a field of activities, nothing more. That the different combinations produce these different reactions. Desire, hatred, happiness and distress. But they're just reactions in a field of activities. They're actually separate from us. And so when we come beyond this, we'll get to the 14th chapter. So in this chapter we're understanding that the body and the interactions of the body are separate from us. They're a field of activities only. They're a playing field. We, the soul, are different. But we still have to understand this playing field. So when we come to the 14th chapter, we will learn about the modes of material nature, which is basically describing how the material nature is the mind. And the Srimad Bhagavatam is described in this process of creation how the combination of the Pradhan, which is the base material nature, with the mode of ignorance produces the false ego, and with the mode of passion produces the mind, and with the mode of goodness produces the intelligence. I might not be perfectly correct in that. So how this modes of nature actually take this material energy, which by itself is sometimes described as like a cloud. It's like it's there, the Pradhan is there, but without the modes of nature shaping it and putting form in it to it, there's nothing. So these modes of nature put the form on the material nature. And then Krishna inserts, inoculates the living entities. And thus all growth, all activities and everything else can take place. So this is the importance, um, as Mukundada was saying in yesterday's class, that Srila Prabhupada considered that the understanding of the 14th chapter about the modes of material nature is one of the most important chapters that will bring us to the point of liberation, to actually separate us from these interactions of the modes of nature. Because while we can understand theoretically that the body is not ours, it's very difficult to dissociate from these interactions, these emotions, um, the different interactions with other living entities in the material world. We consider, I was thinking also it relates, the misunderstanding is understood with the Christian's misunderstanding of the part of Old Testament, the Bible, where the Lord says to, to somebody, I give you dominion over all plants and animals and everything in this world. So then some later Christians have misinterpreted that dominion means, okay, therefore the animals are ours, we can kill them and eat them. This is, this is the argument. The Lord gave us, God gave us dominion over plants and animals, therefore it's ours to do what I want with. But one devotee gave a, a, an analogy to try and help understand. She said, okay, so if you leave your child with the babysitter next door, you're giving dominion of your child to your next door neighbor, but you don't expect to come back and find your next door neighbor has killed it and eaten it. <laughs> But 
this misinterpretation will happen unless we fully understand in this verse today this the actual importance of understanding moving and not moving. Krishna is not just saying human beings have dominion over everything else. He's saying everything that we see, everything that is around us is a combination of the material nature and the living entity. And also we've already learned before how the super soul is there alongside every individual soul as the second knower of the field, as the knower of all fields, Paramatma. So therefore we shouldn't disrespect or misuse any, anything in this entire creation. The Christian idea of having dominion over doesn't mean it's actually ours to exploit. Um, this is explained in Isha Panisha, Isha Vasram Pidam Saram Yat Kinchi Jigat Jajigat. Jaina Chaktena Pujita Maitra Tasya That, yes, Krishna, as the Supreme Lord, has given us our portion to maintain ourselves. And that includes other, other living entities. And this material world is described in the scriptures as a place where one living, living entity survives by eating other living entities. If you eat a salad, the lettuce is also a living entity. You can't get away from it. This is the material world. We this, this body that we claim is our own is only maintained by consuming other living entities. But it's the nature of the material world. It's how it works. It's not a nice place. That's why Srila Prabhupada said this material world is no place for a gentleman. We shouldn't want to be here. So, we have to understand that this whole material world is a combination of the modes of material nature and the living entities. And it includes moving and non-moving. And it includes the living entities, Sarvagata, everywhere. So everything, everywhere, has material nature, has living entities, and has the super soul. So many super souls, smaller than the smallest, even inside the little living entity. Now, one other thing, just to understand how this chapter is developing, is that I'll just briefly go through some of these, rest of these verses. In Buri uh, book, Surrender Unto Me. Because our mind tends to get us into trouble. 
So one who sees the super soul everywhere, as I was trying to explain, if we see the super soul everywhere and we see the living entity everywhere, then we won't misuse. Bori Jang says one should be neither disturbed nor envious. So if we really fully realize that everywhere there is this other living entities who are parts and parcels of Krishna as we are, and also there is the super soul from whom we come, who is our maintainer, who is our best friend, then we shouldn't be disturbed by other living entities <coughs> who at most are the agents of our karma. And we shouldn't be envious of other living entities. One who can see that all activities are performed by the body, which is created of material nature, and sees that the self does nothing, actually sees. So we are not the doer. This, is, we, this has been explained many times. We actually do nothing. The influence of the modes of material nature affect us, and we seem to be doing something. Buri Jan says, this helps to give us humility and engendering humility, because the individual soul actually is not the actor. We can't do anything. When a sensible man ceases to see different identities due to different material bodies, and sees how beings are expanded everywhere, he attains to the Brahman conception. So this is the same view again. We cease to see this different entity, I'm envious of this entity, I'm disturbed by this entity, this person disturbs me, this person said something. If we actually see, if we cease to see this, and see the soul and the super soul everywhere, then we attain to Brahman conception, which is a point of liberation. Krishna explains later on, from this point of liberation, Brahma Buddha Prasanna Brahma Sajjati Kakshati Sama Sarvesha Pratesha Mad Bhakti Lavatevara So when we come to this point, Brahma Buddha, of the Brahman stage of realization, that's when real devotional service will happen. At the moment we're practicing devotional service, and it's the, it's the process to get to liberation. And from there we will engage in real devotional service. position, this position, those with the vision of eternity can see that the imperishable soul is transcendental, eternal and beyond the modes of nature. Despite contact with the material body, Arjuna, the soul neither does anything nor is intended. So this vision is the vision of eternity. So in the last verse, Prabhupada sums up in his purport. The purport of this 13th chapter is that one should know the distinction between the body, the owner of the body, and the super soul. One should recognize the process of liberation as described in verses 8 through 12. Then one can go to the supreme destination. So that was written in verse 35, which reads, <coughs> Those who see with eyes of knowledge the difference between the body and the knower of the body, which we try to understand here, and can also understand the process of liberation from bondage and material nature pertaining to the Supreme Law. So that verses 8 through 12. Began with Anami, Anami, Tram, and Anam. This process of knowledge, beginning with humili humility, pridelessness, non-violence, tolerance, simplicity, and coming up to devotional service, it's describing this process of disentangling ourselves. It's basically the process of devotional service. So knowing this, we can attain supreme destination. just summarizes things again. And he concludes by saying, these things are meant for contemplation and for realization. And one should have a complete understanding of this chapter with the help of the spiritual master. And this is the conclusion of this chapter. <coughs> so, should read today's verse again. 
own chief of the voters, know that whatever you see in existence, both the moving and the non-moving, is only a combination of the field of activities and the knower of the field. So does anyone have any comments or questions about today's class? Hare Krishna, can you pass it? The mic's behind you, but can you just pass it to another part of of Brahman includes understanding that everything that, that, that Brahman includes everything that takes birth in material nature which is actually an astonishing concept it also uh, establishes that everything is part of the transcendental energy even if it's called material my question is something that you said um, <clears throat> now we're not actually doing devotional service we're practicing devotional service but a transcendental service is, is transcendental the devotional service is transcendental yes. how can it depend on the realization of the so-called doer because it's transcendental. Just because a tree falls in the forest and I wasn't there to hear it, does that mean there was a sound or not? So that's my question is, is it transcendental or is it not transcendental? Is it really transcendental? Devotional service. I understood that that's what's purifying us the fact that we act in devotional service is purifying us. Krishna is purifying us within because we're doing devotional service. So I like That's my bewilderment. Okay, so when we begin to study the deity worship, and actually when we come to the point of second initiation, one of the questions for second initiation is why is Brahman initiation important? Why is deity wish important? If chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is sufficient in itself for self-realization, for perfection. So, there are some, I did some research into Srila Prabhupada's writings to find the answer to that question because I was doing like sample answers for this question. And there's some very nice answers where Srila Prabhupada explains that when we engage in deity worship, we're actually engaging our material senses. Yeah, it's service. But the difference between a material person doing material things and us doing something transcendental it's, it's not just how we engage our senses. It's much more than that. It in, includes, this, so this second initiation, this Brahman initiation, we engage in this um, process of, devo of deity worship because the regulation involved is purifying. It helps to purify us from our um, bodily conception. Because we do things because they're given to us by the spiritual master. We have to practice external and internal cleanliness, chanting mantras and things. We have to become one of the reasons why this timing is important. In deity worship, Prabhupada was said the two important things are cleanliness and timing. So cleanliness helps to develop our external cleanliness. And timing is important because we have to put aside our personal interests in order to serve the deity when he wants to be served. So it's about regulating our mind and our activities. And this regulation is purified. In a, same, in a similar way to Varnashram Dharma, there's meant to be 
throughout the whole society because it's a way of purifying the whole society by regulating. So this regulation is purifying. So the other thing about the deity worship is we're engaging our material senses in serving a deity. What's the difference between us dressing a deity and a five-year-old child dressing a Barbie doll? The dressing the Barbie doll, you know, the, the dolls that come out with the dresses already made and you just put them on. My marriage gave one glass on it one time and he says, he, he was speaking to a girl at the time, he said, because the girl, she's relating to this doll on her own level. She's saying, let's go and do this, I want to do this, let's go and do this. She's relating to this doll as if it was hers. But we're relating to the deity as a Supreme Person of God, which is why we're taught to worship the deity in the mood of worship of Lakshmi Narayan, even though we know that our highest goal is Radha Krishna and Golok Vrindavan. Because it's this process in our embodied state, this process of worshiping in a little awe and reverence and following regular principles that will purify us which um, Krishna also says in that verse 728, he, talk, he talks about this process of purification. Yesham tantakata papam jananam punya karmanam tevan varam hanyamukta vajate mam trudavitaha Persons who have acted piously in previous lives and in this life and whose sinful actions are completely eradicated are free from the dualities of delusion and they engage themselves in my service with determination. So, what makes devotional service different from a material activities? So, we're going, we're going a little far afield in my actual question. For example, Prabhupada often made the statement, even just to turn a screw, in the temple room for beginning a devotional service or sweeping the floor the temple is cleaning your heart whether you're initiated or not initiated first initiated second initiated deity worship is done by the uninitiated and the first initiated as well as second initiated deity worship is included when you attend the artis and kirtans you're going there and the pujari is acting on your behalf. So devotional service is there. The old bum at 26 Second Avenue came in with a roll of toilet paper. And Prabhupada said, yes, now his devotional service has begun. And the reason, so, the reason why it's begun is the mercy of the spiritual master. Because Prabhupada offered it to Krishna. Yeah? It's, it's the difference. A lot of the cases, the difference is that the, what makes the difference, if we're doing it in order to serve even the Guru, the Guru then offers to Krishna no matter what we do, it becomes devotional service. Right, so my point is, how do we come up with this idea that it's not real devotional service until we get from I know there's that verse, Brahma Guru Prasanna. 1861, Brahma Guru Prasanna. Yeah. I realize that. It says. But what happens before that? Is this not transcendental? It's purifying. Therefore, it must be some kind of devotional service. You don't just automatically get into Brahma realization. No. You have to. It's a gradual process. So yeah. The whole process is a means and an end, from, from my, what my understanding is. And also, I remember seeing this written in black and white, with the means and the end. So, how, how could we possibly think that what we've been doing is not devotional service? Yeah, even Srila Prabhupada says, it's pure devotional service. If your intention is to serve the pure devotee, then it's pure devotional service. I think, I, I still think the magic key is that the spiritual master is offering to Krishna, that makes it devotional service. Well, Prabhupada has given a 
viruses in the entire universe. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the basic thing. I mean, there I is, we, we know that people get only out Sukriti, which brings them to devotional self. Like simple things like when they come into our temple here and we get them to offer some water to Tulsi. That gives them some Sukriti, some Bhakti on Mukhi Sukriti, because they're serving the pure devotee. And uh, that's also based on Prabhupada's mercy. It's also the mercy of the spiritual master. They don't know what's happening, but it's also Shiva Prabhupada's mercy. And that I agree. But I still am not, I will never be convinced that what I've been doing for 40 years, whether or not I've attained a modernization, is not, not transcendent because I, I can understand that it's purifying. Prabhupada says it's a gradual process. Process, you're in the process, the process is transcendent. There's no loss, no diminution. Yeah. So what does that mean? That means that the devotional service has to be devotional service. It's not, it's not shadow devotional service. It's not pretend devotional service, depending on the intention of the Yeah, practice. it's an intention. Well, Kundi Dada was speaking also on that yesterday. This, how these people who learn by hearing, some of them learn very slowly, and some of them yeah. learn more quickly, according to their determination. Because, yeah. It's our intention, as you just said, the words, it's our intention. Because also, there are a lot of people hanging around ISKCON who don't seem to be making much progress. And their intention doesn't seem to be devotional service. But are they engaged in devotional service? How much are they engaged if their intention is self-interested? The process itself is devotional service. I mean, we try and we try and he's an artist. We try and engage them because the process is purified. So even if they show some slight interest in doing some service, we encourage them and we give them service and we try and help them and we try and keep this side, encourage them in their side of that. But if they're yeah. We try and engage in the service because that's the purest process of purification. It's not just those people, it's also people like me and you who may have been engaged for such a long time that somehow or other we've deviated in our mental conception of things. See what I've done here. Look at me. Look at me. It's that that ego comes in and then you fall. You fall from that. This is one of the one of the uh, the uh, an art is brought on, brought on by Bhakti. Yeah. So so even even at that stage there's there's a danger. So I suppose not just the mercy of the spiritual master, the mercy of Krishna, but your, your intense desire. And that's what Prabhupada said. How do you become a devotee? How do you how do you become Krishna conscious? He said, is it, that there's a one word answer, desire. Yeah, that's in the beginning of the devotion also. Simple. The, the simple basis, if you want to engage in devotional service. Does anybody else have a problem with, with what I was having a problem? Mm -hmm. Am I the only one who thinks about things like this? No. Yeah. Regarding the devotional service, Prabhupada gave another statement in 9.2, 9 chapter, second yeah. verse, last paragraph. Actual devotional service starts after liberation. Yeah. In this case, uh, he said Brahma put the person one is, one is situated in the Brahman position. 9.2, last paragraph. One is situated in the Brahman position once the devotional service begins. Yeah, so he's quoting that same verse that I quoted, which is 1861. So everyone's, so everyone's trying to calculate according to an art of energy or calculate by our material calculation. Have we reached Brahman? Well, but Prabhupada said we can tell by our 
Detachment. One of our key, key ways we can tell our advances is, is our detachment. It is not being... And attachment for proof. Yes. Yeah, not being disturbed by things that happen to us. When you look at the devotees, like you look at the story of the Mahabharata, you look at the Pandavas and what happened to them, we get detached. We still get disturbed by small things. They didn't get disturbed by such great things. So that's one of the key ways that we can gauge our advancement is this being disturbed by all the reverses of our lives. And aside from that, we have to check with Guru Sadhu and Shastra, especially the Guru who's around us. You wanted to say something? Parvati uh, Mataji said, when we do the devotion service, slight ahava develops what I did. Some degree we can accept, right? So because uh, some something like that. Yeah, I think if I am very happy, if I finish 16 round really, I am very happy. If I attend Mangalarti really, I am, yes, of course, some Mahandar is there, but I am attending Mangalarti. Yeah, that's also described, I think, I think it may be Bhakti when I talk, Thakur, who says, we talks about this material designations, how we want to get rid of Sarvapati Vinaya Mokta. Now, Uparis are material designations, and how actually calling ourselves a devotee is also a designation. Yes, now I'm a devotee. But this is this is a de designation. Well, yes, it is a designation. It is, for the time being, helpful for us, as you were saying. Yes, I, at I attended Mogulati this morning. That's good, because we're encouraging ourselves. So yes, it's a designation. Eventually, we want to give it up. But just now, it's useful for us. So don't try and give up prematurely this designation. I'm doing devotional service. At, you know, it, it makes me feel good. It's allowed to in the meantime. We're allowed to make ourselves feel good because we're pleasing the spiritual. Yeah, terrible before. Because if we let our mind get away from us, just this once, can I sleep in? And then the mind will say, just next time, can I sleep in? You know. So yeah. We can, this is a decent, this is an apari, this is a designation that we can in the meantime use to help us remain committed to Prabhupada's instructions. Thank you. Mother, regarding what you said, I will just, I don't know much, but I will just ask you, whether Brahma Bhuta Prasannatma, is it a, is it like the natural growth of a person in spiritual life, as would happen apart from the mercy that we have got from God Chaitanya. In the sense that uh, for us this devotional service is a gift given which we do not deserve. But having 